Hi, I'm Mo, and I wanted to talk today about the physical complications of mental illness. So th I think the stigma around mental illness in the Silicon Valley comes from the fact that you can't see mental illness. It's pretty much all in your head. It's not tangible, so it may as well be invisible. But the thing is, it's actually a really more dangerous um, illness than you would think. If you think about it this way, organisms' main goal is to survive. They will do anything to live, but mental illness overcomes this primal foundational instinct and causes people to commit suicide. So it's really not just a psychological problem, it's also a real um, biological one. Now this happens to everyone at some point where they get so stressed or so worked up that something in their body changes and they don't feel as well as they usually would. For example, last night I was walking around my kitchen at 2 a.m. giving this presentation to my dog and I could not breathe. And that happens to everyone once in a while. But then when it happens over a long period of time, that's what you would call a mental illness. This is, um, many of you have probably seen before, the difference between a brain of a depressed person and the brain of a normal person. And there is like not enough biological activity in the depressed person's brain because their brain doesn't function the same way. And this is what most mental illness medication presents today. What it does, it, it usually focuses on the activity in the brain and how to change it and force it to become more like the mental, the mental health of a normal person's brain. Most mental illness medication today, the most popular one and the safest one is an SSRI. Uh, that's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what it does is, well, there's serotonin in your brain just floating around and the more you have of it, the happier you are. But some people aren't able to make a natural amount of this enough to make them not only just happy, but mentally healthy. So what an SSRI does is it blocks the channels that recycle serotonin because serotonin is broken down and then turned into some other neurotransmitter and it keeps this recycling from happening, so then you can have um, more serotonin kind of floating around in your brain, even though your brain doesn't really want it to be there. So it's kind of like forcing your happiness. But it works really well for a lot of people combined with um, behavioral therapy. So, but now what we're trying to do is go beyond changing what causes depression and going to why depression is caused, or anxiety is caused, or really any other mental illness. In our body, any molecule comes from a gene. Any protein you have floating around your body comes from because a gene expresses that into a protein. Here is a gene, one of the many genes that can be related back to mental illness. The serotonin transporter gene, as you can probably tell, transports serotonin from where it's made in a cell to your brain, but sometimes it doesn't function properly. So basically, if you think about it, your genes can at least partially control your feelings. Now we have to go to epigenetics to see what we can do with the concept that genes can affect your emotions. So epigenetics is uh, basically an external system of genetic expression that not many people know about because it was discovered quite recently actually. So you have trillions of cells in your body and each of them have the exact same set of DNA. But I've always wondered why do some cells turn into skin cells and some turn into brain cells and so on and so forth. What happens is there's a thing called epigenetics that physically constricts your genome to expressing only the things it, like the cell wants it to express. So you have a cell in your brain, other cells uh, send signals to that cell and say to the gene, hey, only express this part. And that's why some, part of your, some cells are skin cells and some are brain cells and so on and so forth. So there's the actual blueprint of your body, which the DNA is known as, and then it's what I would call the interior designer, which is epigenetics. So it controls how the building is built, basically. This is why twins, some of the, they have the exact same DNA, but if one smokes and the other doesn't, it, they develop cancer because their epigenetics are changed. Epige so imagine your DNA as a long rope. If the rope is coiled, then you can't use it, and if the rope is uncoiled, then you can use it. The way the coiling and uncoiling happens in um, DNA is methane or a methyl group, and it attaches to the DNA. The more methyl there is in an area, the more coiling occurs. So if you think about it, you can kind of throw methyl at a gene if you want it to stop working, and it'll coil up, and it won't work anymore. And you can do it the reverse way, too, by taking methyl out of this. But if it's that easy, why aren't we doing that with depression or mental illness already? Well, people actually are using epigenetics in different types of therapy, and one thing that they're actually using it on is cancer therapy, because 
cancer is clearly something that's not supposed to be there. There's a lump of cells in your body and you want it to go away. And the, this lump of cells in your body occurs because there's something wrong with your gene and because it's so obvious to tell that you have cancer, then it's easier for a scientist to pinpoint, hey, where, where did the cell cycle go wrong in order for these cells to react the way they do? Here are a bunch of different types of cancers that have been treated with methylation therapy in combination with other types of therapy like chemotherapy. Chemotherapy and an SSRI can kind of be like compared to each other. An SSRI tries to fix the problem in your brain, kind of like putting tape over a crack in the wall. Just like chemotherapy tries to get rid of the problem but not really cause, but fix the root of the problem. And that's what we would do with cancer. The thing with mental illness is that you can't find one specific gene that targets mental illness. 28% of mental illness is hereditary, but it's not just one gene. In fact, it's not even just depression or anxiety. It's bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, any type of mental illness you can think of it has some her hereditary concept to it. So here we have another, um, another picture of epigenetic sequence, and you can see the methyl groups onto it. And the proteins that you see there are called histones, and that's what they wrap around, and that's what um, the methylation therapy in cancer targets. And once we find a gene, or multiple genes, or just any type of way to target a specific gene that will unwrap or wrap a gene that you want to use or you want to stop from using, then that's how you can combine um, therapy and medication, and not just put a piece of tape over the problem, but fill the wall with plaster, more of permanent solution rather than a, um, rather than a temporary one. So what, um, what most people think in this area is that since you can't see it, there's really not much to be done about it. But there is a lot to be done about it. Like when you experience high periods of stress, like during finals or something's like an uh, issue in your life that really can't be fixed, you, you get high blood pressure, you have trouble sleeping, you have trouble eating, and that's, that's normal for everyone in their lifetimes for like a week or two weeks or something like that. But for some people, this happens every single day of their lives where they feel con like constant anxiety and depression, and that's what these medications are for. Even though you can't see it, it's definitely there. And people with depression and anxiety are more likely to die of heart disease or even more likely to get mumps in their older age. So it weakens your immune system. It does everything to make you a less healthy person, which is why preventative care for depression and anxiety is one of the most important things you can do for yourself, not only just now, but in the long run. Because there's no point in working so hard if you end up not being mentally healthy enough to enjoy it in the future. What I hope that you all take away from this talk today is that mental illness is a real problem. It's not just in your head, as I've said many times before. It's a it's a problem that can be treated with medication, and there are innovations being made to make it less of a challenging task. But in the end, it all starts with you realizing that there is an issue to take care of. And if you take care of it, you will be a healthier person in the long run. Thank you.